Welcome to the Play Podcast with me, Douglas Schatz. Hello, and welcome to episode 40 of the Play Podcast, where we explore the greatest new and classic plays. I'm Douglas Schatz, founder and host of the Play Podcast. The curtain rises. A dead dog lies in a pool of blood in the middle of the stage. A large garden fork is sticking out of its side. The owner of the dog, Mrs. Shears, stands beside it, screaming, Holy fuck! What in fuck's name have you done to my dog? Her cry is directed at 15-year-old Christopher Boone, who is kneeling beside the dog, covered in its blood. As Mrs. Shears challenges Christopher, he puts his hands over his ears, closes his eyes, and rolls forward, pressing his forehead onto the grass. He starts groaning. This is the startling opening to Simon Stevens' theatrical adaptation of Mark Haddon's best-selling novel, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. The novel and the play are a murder mystery like no other, as the young Christopher embarks on his own project to discover the identity of the dog's killer, it not being him, despite the initial impression the opening tableau suggests. What makes it a mystery unlike any other is not just that the victim is a dog, or that the self-appointed detective is a teenager, but that Christopher is a unique character who sees the world differently from anyone else. He describes himself as a mathematician with some behavioral difficulties. Difficulties that include having trouble interpreting the world or expressing his feelings in a conventional way or being preoccupied by unusual details such as how many red cars he sees in a day or avoiding the colors yellow and brown and being anxious when confronted with a new environment and people. As he says, he does have an exceptional aptitude for math and an effervescent interest and knowledge of stars and space, as well as acute powers of observation and memory. He makes for a formidable detective, but in pursuing his project, he discovers much more than he set out to find. And in so doing, we see the real practical and emotional challenges that life consists of for him and for his parents and the teachers who care about him. Mark Haddon's innovative novel was published in 2003, winning the Whitbread Book of the Year Award and going on to endear itself to millions of readers. It's been called the nation's favorite book. Playwright Simon Stevens' magical adaptation of the book was originally produced at the National Theatre in 2012, directed by Marion Elliott, before transferring to London's West End, where it won seven Olivier Awards in 2013, including Best New Play. The show then ran on Broadway for nearly two years, winning the Tony Award for Best Play in 2015. And as I record this, it has just finished a successful run at the Troubadour Wembley Park Theatre in London and embarks on a tour of 16 theatres around the UK, as well as a visit to Dublin between January and May 2022. Simon Stevens is one of the most acclaimed and prolific playwrights of our time, whose work has been originated at theatres around the globe in Germany, the USA, Japan, the Netherlands, and of course, here in the UK. He has authored more than three dozen plays since his professional debut at the festival in Edinburgh in 1997. And of course, it is impossible for me to list all of them here and inequitable to choose just a few, but a random selection includes Port, Pornography, Punk Rock, Song from Far Away, Heisenberg, and the small gem that is Seawall, one of my favorites, as well as adaptations of classics such as A Doll's House, The Cherry Orchard, and The Three Penny Opera. A number of his plays have premiered at the Royal Court Theatre in London, where he was a tutor for their Young Writers Program from 2001 to 2005, and where more recently he has presented five series of the Playwrights podcast, talking with some of the world's greatest playwrights about their work. If the subject matter wasn't enough, the vast knowledge, intelligence, warmth, and humor of the presenter make it one of my absolute favorite listens. So I'm hugely excited and honored, not to say a little odd, <laughs> to be able to talk today with Simon himself about the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. Welcome, Simon. Thank you, Douglas. That's an incredibly generous introduction. It's so funny because I always do introductions like that on my podcast, and it's always a disarming experience for the person who I'm talking to. <laughs> really... I've stolen the idea from you, really. <laughs> I've never had the experience of being disarmed myself by lis listening to that story. And go, oh, yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> Great. That's a first. And part of me would love to go rogue and just talk to you as you do to the playwrights you interview on the court podcast about your whole life and work. But I'm going to restrain myself and stick to the order of the day 
and our regular format to cover this play. However, before we dive into the play itself, I wonder if you could give the few listeners who may not be familiar with the original novel or your play a brief summary of the story it tells so they know what we're talking about a bit. Yeah, I mean, I think you described it pretty well in your introduction, I have to say. I, uh, I, so Christopher discovers the corpse of Wellington, who is, is the neighbour's dog that he really, really loves. Uh, and as you said, he's he's accused or suspected of killing the dog. And he's kind of arrested on the night of the discovery because when a, a policeman comes to talk to him about it, he attacks the policeman who tries to touch him because he does not like being touched by anybody, uh, at least of all strangers. So he's got this promise of a caution hanging over his head as he embarks on the attempt to find out who killed the dog. And because you you know, you know, warned me in advance that we're not in a territory where we need to be careful of spoilers, what he learns is, as he investigates, he learns two things that really unsettle his sense of self and unsettle his sense of his world one of which is that contrary to the lies that his father has told him his mother has not died but rather fell in love with another man and left his family home his mother is living in london and has been writing writing letters to him for years that his father's been hiding from him and that also on the same night that he discovers that his mother's still alive and that his mother's been trying to write to him uh, his father also confesses that he is the man who killed Wellington the dog uh, in a kind of burst of rage when the dog attacked him. And it's quite an interesting thing. Christopher is terrified, not because his father lied to him, but because his father has the capacity to kill. And he equates the murder of the dog with being with with being the murder of a human. So he thinks that his father is potential has the potential to kill him. Yeah. And he decides that he can't live at home anymore. He runs away, runs away from Swindon, his hometown. And this is a boy who's never left his street on his own before. But he runs away from not only his street, but his hometown. He gets on the train and he goes to London to find his mum. And he does find his mum and initiates some kind of reconciliation with his mother. His mother is living with the... Is living with the, the, the husband of the neighbour, the man she fell in love with. And almost immediately upon arrival in London, Christopher tells everybody that he has to go back to Swindon because he's doing his maths A-level. And uh, the pressure that Christopher's presence puts on his mother and her boyfriend in the small flat in London that they're living in means that she leaves her boyfriend. She takes Christopher back to Swindon. He sits his maths A-level paper. And... There is the the foothills of a reconciliation between Christopher and his dad, which is facilitated by the the theatrical coup of a small puppy. <laughs> Did you know when you wrote this moment how how triumphant it would be in the theater? Because I tell you, last week when I saw the show, I mean, the entire audience had this wonderful sigh. Oh. When the puppy comes out of the box, I mean, the most irresistibly cute puppy. So it is a winning moment. Surefire. Did you know that that would be surefire? Um, I knew um, I knew it's beautiful in the book. I knew it's tender in the book. Uh, I knew the possibility of reconciliation is was beautiful and tender. When my wife first saw it and she saw the second preview, she thumped my arm really hard when the puppy came out of the box. And, you know... She's a potty-mouthed woman. She whispered to me, a fucking puppy. <laughs> and then I thought, she's she's really going to think that I'm just going for the cheap shots. But she said something really interesting on the way home. She said, no, it works. And she defined, I think, why it works, which is the whole journey of that play is to try to create a space whereby the audience can see the world from Christopher's point of view. That's the whole job of the play, is to try to allow people to see the world as Christopher sees it. And we get close to it, but we never really do until the moment the puppy gets out of the box. And then we all react to the puppy in the same way that Christopher does. So finally, after this two hours in the theatre together, we get this moment where we see the world like Christopher sees it too. Your wife was right on reflection. It's not a cheap trick because it hits you. It does hit you for real. And I think one of the reasons you're saying actually is what you said earlier is that the reason he runs away from his father is that threat to the dog. So somehow that ties it up for him that, yeah. that he's restored the dog 
And he cares as much about the yeah. dogs as he does about human beings in a funny way. And so that works. It makes sense. Yeah. No, I was just going to talk about when I read the novel for the first time. And I, re I read the novel 10 years before I wrote the adaptation. I was writing Motortown at the time. And I knew that in Motortown, I wanted to have a neurodiverse character. And I, I knew that Mark had written this novel that was something of a masterpiece in the consideration of that type of neurodiversity. And I remember reading it, loving it, but also thinking, I really want to know what the people surrounding Christopher are, are like. I really wanted to incarnate the constellation of people that surrounded Christopher. In particular, I was really interested in the dad. I was really interested in Ed. And that, that moment where this guy who's like, he's a, you know, he's a boiler engineer. Now, a, a boiler engineer is a very skilled job, but it's not, not a job for which you need a, a degree in psychotherapy or you need to have a, a nuanced training in the, the challenges of neurodiversity. But he does, and he rises to that job, and he's a good dad, and then he messes up big time. So there's the possibility of that reconciliation, I think, is really moving. I was going to ask you what you were saying about earlier about the perspective of our wanting to see the world as Christopher does. So when you read the novel, and I guess one of my primary questions is, what did you think about how to translate this into a stage play? What were the challenges and how do you replicate that perspective? Because the novel is written in the first person. And in fact, actually, it's a book. Christopher's writing, but it's his story in the first person. And we spend yeah. the entire novel essentially inside his view of the world. For sure. Yeah. How do you make that happen in three dimensions on the stage? I'd never done an adaptation before. I was excited by the intellectual challenges of it. I had no idea. I had no idea, Douglas. I didn't have a kind of root map. This is how you do an adaptation. So I just kind of intuited it. And in the, in the end, I intuited my way to two particular techniques. I was aware, I was really aware of one fundamental difference between the art of the novelist and the art of the dramatist. So that whereas a novelist can deal with reflection and observation, memory and idea, the dramatist deals exclusively in behaviour. It's not what characters feel that count. It's not what characters say or observe. It's what characters do. And a, and a play captures or tries to capture the, the realisation of idea through behaviour, not through reflection. So Mark's book is an exquisite study of the interiority of somebody's mind, but it's full of all these amazing little avenues and cul-de-sacs where he'll just go down something that Christopher's thinking about. But I knew that in the theatre, th those kind of things would struggle. So the first thing that I did was I went through the book and I made a, a list of just all the things that Christopher did. Not what he said, not what he felt, not what he remembered, but what he did. And that became the spine of my play. And then the second thing I did, and I get mocked so much for this by my kids, who just say that fundamentally all I ever do is copy and paste plays. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my daughter is 15 now. She's like, when are you going to just like write one of your own? But I kind of landed on the idea of, of transcribing all the direct speech. I just created a kind of skeleton script of those moments where he'd made the decision to have the character speak out loud. And, and I had like a 25-page skeleton of a script and I got some actors at the National Theatre Studio to read it to me just to see if we thought there might be something in it. And they were all very encouraging and very excited. I think, though, that to go back to the specifics of your question, how do you capture the, the interiority? I think it's through the structure. I think it's through the scenic structure. The simple scenic rule that Christopher is in every scene, uh, you put the central character in every scene, it's a really easy one, and it seems almost a banal one, but actually it really presents you from a subjective point of view. And then also the scenic structure is not defined by chronological logic, it's defined by Christopher's emotional logic. So when he's thinking about something, whenever he's remembering something, that's where we go. Yes. So if he's at school and he's asked about his memory of his mother, then we go to the memory of the mother. 
if he's at home and he's remembering the time his dad asked the head teacher for permission to do the A level, then we go to the dad asking the head teacher for permission to do the A level. So structurally, we follow Christopher's mind. And then that, I think, led to the decisions that Marion Elliott and Bonnie Christie made when it came to designing the play in terms of needing a space that didn't present the world objectively. You know, you can't do this with like a living room. You can't do it with a classroom. You can't do it with a street. We needed a design that was as fluid as Christopher's mind. So if Christopher wants to be on the street with Mrs. Alexander, bang, everything leads him to be on the street with Mrs. Alexander. And all the company and everybody on stage and the sound and the light, they're taking him there. If he wants to be an astronaut in outer space, he's an astronaut in outer space. So all of the design decisions came out of that structural decision to follow Christopher's mind. And on stage, it happens really fluently. It's very fluid, the way he moves and the scenes move between each other and even in time, as you say. But you also, I think there was the device, isn't there, where the structure of the book is that Christopher is reading or is writing a book telling the story. So there's a kind of layers and layers there. (laughs) And you have the teacher, Siobhan, reads from his book as well. So we do get actually some of his voice through her. Yeah, that, yeah, that's right. That's a simple answer to your question. Just get the teacher to read out what's going on in his mind. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, it's one of them. You know, I, I do think, I often talked about this, I used to be a teacher. Um, and from a family of teachers, you know, my mum was a teacher, my granddad was a teacher. Um, and I still teach now. And teaching is a really elemental, fundamental part of my life, I think. I knew that there would be something about the teacher character that people would really recognize. I always make the point that everybody who's ever been to school, even people who hate school or leave it at 14 and and only have grim memories of it, even they have a favorite teacher, somebody who got them in a way that nobody else had ever got them before. And I just thought if we make the teacher, who in the novel is, she's only in the novel for about three sentences. I just thought if we build the play around the teacher, then we'll create a situation where dramatically people can recognize themselves just a little bit. And also, she reads Christopher's book from the same point of view of the readers of the novel read Christopher's book. The same sense of understanding more than Christopher can and the dramatic irony of realizing the bits that Christopher doesn't realize, but also a sense of awe and wonder at the way this boy sees the world and a kind of sense of envy at the way he sees the world You know, not only because he can see a beauty that we often miss, but also sometimes, you know, human interaction is tiring, isn't it? (laughs) Yes, yes. Sometimes you you, you want to be able to go, I don't want to talk to you. (laughs) So I think she really works as a device that, that releases Christopher's interiority for us, I think. She's incredibly important, not just because, she, as you say, she relays his words at times, but because of her perspective and her and her sympathy and support, but she's also realistic about the world, yeah. but respectful of him and in a way, a, yeah. an alternative to his parents. And what you were saying earlier about the other characters, the other thing that struck me about the perspective of the play, Simon, which is it takes on extra life, is, that, is the other characters. You say, because, of course, they are actually there. They do speak out loud themselves. Yeah. And although the words, as we know, actually come from Christopher's memory, yeah. when you see them being spoken for real by people, there's an extra layer. You can actually read into the way they're saying them, their physicality, their reactions. There's an extra level. And of course, it brings those adult characters further forward in the story, doesn't it? They have more weight in the balance of the story. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes real sense to me. And that was certainly something that was really central to my impulse before, you know, the start of the book was to try to find the humanity in in the people whose humanity Christopher might not have been that interested in. It really struck me that the play is not just about Christopher, but about the people who surround him and in particular his parents. And it's about family and how and raising children. And oh, my God, the challenges that, that these parents have. You know, we all imagine what would it be like to be Christopher's parent? Yeah. You know, they're ordinary people dealing with extraordinary challenges, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. And that, that comes across even more strongly, I think, in the play than the book, because you see them. They have a life of their own of sorts on stage. I love the way the there's a scene where it's a rainy night in Swindon 
which is a big work night for a boiler engineer. There's loads of call outs for him. Somebody's cellar's flooded and he's nervous about leaving Christopher on his own. And so he has to check in with Christopher that that's all right. So he asks him if he is. And then Christopher explains to him about why he finds rainfall beautiful. You know, and we all at school, like everybody at school does the water cycle. But I don't think any of us, when we're in London or wherever we are, and it's pouring with rain, have the capacity to go, this water will have been evaporated from like Baffin Bay and will have been travelled across the whole of the Atlantic Ocean and then will fall on us as rain. That's miraculous. (laughs) And, you know, it's not like that that's news to us. But we live our lives in a way that we're preoccupied with other things, like the fact that you've got seven different boilers to fix and three different cellars have flooded and you've got to get out and you've got to make sure your teenage son's safe. And then he has a moment of, I think the actor at the moment really captures the pressure of the phone calls, the pressure of his work and the sense of beauty that his son captures in the way he sees the world. I think that's been really joyful finding those layers and then the other layers as well you know one of the things that I love about the book and that I've never found the literary term that accurately describes a book that is written as though it's an actual book written by an imaginary character in life and you know it's written as though it's written by Christopher and I wanted to find a theatrical equivalent of that kind of the kind of meta layer on top of that which is where the notion of the school play came in, that this is actually what you're watching. You're not actually watching Christopher's dad. What you're actually watching is a school teacher pretending to be Christopher's dad (laughs) in a school play. Or you're watching Christopher's dad playing being Christopher's dad in the school play. You know, there is that kind of meta-theatricality that runs through all of it, I think. You're messing with my head now. (laughs) You're right that those layers are are incredible. And there are several points in the play when the characters do self-consciously refer to the fact that we are watching a play. Yeah. Like Siobhan says to Christopher, when Christopher is wanting to tell her how he solved the math question, Siobhan says, people don't want to, to hear about the answer to a math question in a play. Why don't you tell it after the curtain call? And you're sort of going, <laughs> What? So I was going to ask you, I actually was going to ask you, why did you do this with this extra layer? What is it that it's adding, do you think, to the original? You know, it's what, it's, 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 it's one of the things that I'm most proud about in the accomplishments of this production and this play is you kind of take, you know, you take a dramaturgical technique that people are more familiar with, with kind of postmodern playwriting structures where you acknowledge the theatricality in the performance before playing it rather than just presenting an actual world. You take that technique and you put it in a show in which five million people are delighted by it. Because people love that moment. You know, they love the moment where Christopher stops the action and says, actually, it was my mum who gave me the milkshake. Yes. Not you. And and he directs his mum. He says, you've got to shout really loudly at him, like you're really angry with him, not just being nice. Yeah, that's brilliant. And I think the thing is, that kind of post-Brechtian technique in which you acknowledge the theatricality for the audience. Audiences are aware that they're in a theatre. They're not idiots. You know, they know if they watch a murder on stage that they're not actually watching somebody being murdered. Otherwise, they would storm the stage, you know. They're, They're alert to the theatricality of their own experience. I just wanted to create language in which that alertness, rather than being something that we're embarrassed about and pretend it didn't happen, was absolutely central to the action of the theatre. Honestly, I think everything that's good about this production is is in the novel. And I just tried to find a theatrical language for it. So things like when you read the novel, everybody tells us Christopher's good at maths. That's fine. Christopher's good at maths. All right, that's a characteristic. And then you get to the very end. Mark has Christopher right. Siobhan told me it wouldn't be very interesting if I put the answer to my maths question here. But she said that I could put it as a coder at the end of the book. So that's what I'm going to do. And when you read the coda, for most people, A-star standard A-level maths is pretty high-level maths. And you read this coda, and you're like, oh, my God, this is the same boy who I have maybe thought was funny or difficult or cute or charming or violent or, or miserable or whatever. But look at his mind. Look how smart this boy is. And I wanted to find a theatricality that celebrated that as well.
So it's an amazing moment, Simon. Well, Nakoda, he comes back onto the stage after the curtain call and 1,500 people or whatever it was, actually staying and listening to this explanation of the solution of this math problem. Yeah. <laughs> but it works. The point is it works because they are so with Christopher by that point. Yeah. And the meta bit, whether you're conscious or not, even though, as you say, we know we're in the theater all the time, but by doing it explicitly, you do take a step back somewhere. Yeah. Mentally, you're going to go, okay, I have to think about what Christopher means a bit more. Maybe not even consciously, but somehow that happens so that it does change the perspective a little bit. I think that's right. There's a great point one Christopher says as well. I don't like acting, he says, because it's pretending that something is real when it is not really real at all. So it's kind of a lie. <laughs> yeah. To which Siobhan responds, but people like stories, Christopher. Some people find things which are kind of true and things which are made up, which is a rather beautifully simple way of saying what the play is doing and giving us a character like Christopher, isn't it? It was watching him. We ultimately learn truths about tolerance and, and empathy and survival and love and 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 that's the power of art or metaphor, as he says, the definition of metaphor. This is literally what that play is doing, carrying something from one place to another, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really important to me. I'm I'm suddenly, I always say that I didn't write any of the lines in this play, that I just found a dramatic structure for them, but that all the language is from Mark's novel. But I do think, and I'd be perfectly happy to accept that I'm wrong if people want to hold me to account on this. I do think that line is mine. I do think the line, sometimes people find things that, I mean, it's central to Mark's thinking and it's clearly what the novel is all about. And it's, it's really, really integral to my sense of self. If you'll allow me a, another tangent, I'm really drawn to the thinking of um, the Israeli historian Yuval Noah Harari, whose book Sapiens, the history of the human race, the history of Homo sapien. Really the central thesis that Harari has in that when he's asking the question, which is a question that I ask in every playwriting workshop that I do, which is what's the difference between human beings and other animals? And every play that I've written, I think, has been an investigation of that question. Every time I've ever taught, I've asked that question. And Harari's book is a consideration of that question. And what he argues is that the human being is unique in the animal world in its capacity to believe in things that it can't see. And that is why it can survive in groups of more than 150, because we're defined by faiths and beliefs that are not built on our actual experience. And fundamentally, he would argue, human beings have the capacity to tell and believe in stories. And what gives us our humanness is our capacity to tell stories to one another. What gives us our capacity to survive generationally is that we can pass stories on to one another. And our weaknesses, our central weaknesses, are defined by the fact that we on occasion will commit to stories. And he writes very beautifully at the end of Sapiens about how the 20th century is a century was defined by some stories that were brutal and murderous. You know, the story of Stalin's version of communism, the story of Hitler's national socialism, that capacity for the human animal to believe in things that it can't see and to tell stories to one another is absolutely central to all of my work, I think, and is present in Curious Incident. So it's it's good or bad stories, as you say, and the believing in things you can't see, and you have a language to build these things, these structures, yeah, uh, mental structures or, or reasons, you build reasons to, to why you act. Yeah, yeah. That can, you can think about before you act or after you act, and those become values and that sort of thing. And you talk about the bad stories. I mean, it feels a lot like there are a lot of bad stories around these days that people are dividing themselves up in the world following different bad stories. Yeah. But not sharing the stories very much. I think that's absolutely fundamental to the gesture of the meta theatricality is that when we all acknowledge that we're in a theater together, then we all acknowledge that we're buying into a shared story. And there's something just gorgeous about that feeling that we can't do it in isolation i've been spending a lot of time over the weekend listening to a talking book and and what's really interesting is how lonely it is even a beautiful novel even a novel that makes me feel as though there's people who've seen the world in the way that i've seen it or have released things that i'd not realized fundamentally i am on my own with the novelist and then on a talking book on my own with the novelist and the actor reading the story to me 
when we go to the theatre, and as you say, you know, there's like a thousand people in the Park Wembley Theatre, especially now, especially after this pandemic, for a thousand people to all agree together that we're going to believe that that is Christopher Boone. And so when they see the puppy come out of the box, it's like, yes, I knew <laughs> There's the, sh- the shared the shared euphoria of that possible experience. I think there's, you know, a thousand people's heart beating at the same time is something that's really magical. Yeah, I mean, you're right of saying about novels or even listening to the novel is really just you, right? Because you're not interacting when you're listening to the other reader. And in the theatre, you're not only interacting and sharing with the audience, you're also obviously sharing with the live human beings who are talking to you from the stage. And there was a piece with Mark Rylance over the weekend in the paper about He's done a lot of film recently, and he's been very successful at that. He's a marvelous actor. But he said it's not the same as the theater. And he's so desperate to get back in the theater. And the reason is because what he does requires the audience, the live audience. He needs there to be some kind of interchange in real time. Yeah. And that's why we go to the theater. And that's why it's different. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about judgment, which is a bit stories as well. Maybe this is the link here, tenuous as it is. Because one of the things that goes on in the play, of course, is that Christopher is different. And what we witness, and we witness it possibly even more strongly on stage than we do in the novel, Simon, because these people are really there, is how people react to Christopher as well. Both his parents, but we also see everybody he meets, you know, like the policeman, the the guard at the railway station who's selling a ticket or whatever it is. And a lot of the time it's with an impatience, clearly, because, of course, they jump to a conclusions and they're just seeing the world in their own way, and they have no idea how Christopher sees it, and they judge his behavior, which is, I think that's got to be one of the lessons or themes about what's going on with the character of Christopher, isn't it? I think so. And uh, what I'd I'd hate is for people to think that I was judging the ticket inspector who was frustrated because Christopher jumped the queue to get his ticket first, or that I was judging the police officer who was called out at seven minutes after midnight to investigate the case of the murdered dog and finds this 15 year old covered in blood who then attacks him. Cause I'm, you know, while it may be true that they're baffled by Christopher and that their bafflement manifests itself in impatience and frustration. And that's fundamentally ungenerous to the person whose story we're watching. You know, I also think, Like Christopher would be a really hard, it'd be a really hard kid to parent. Yes, that's true. And if I was a cop working at midnight in Swindon and uh, I was called out because somebody's dog had been murdered and I had to go and investigate it and that what confronted me was this 15 year old who then assaulted me, I think I'd be at the end of my tether too, (laughs) you know. So it'd be ironic if I judged them for judging him. But I think if the play's about anything, it's maybe an attempt to celebrate the possibility that kindness can yield miracles. But I think it's true. If you have the time to be just kind and you have the time to listen and you have the time to try and investigate what Christopher's thinking, then maybe you'll come to see your world in a different way. The irony is part of Christopher's neurology means that he finds empathy tricky. You know, as he says, he finds people confusing. And theatre for me, I always think of it as being, it's an empathy machine, <laughs> you know. And and I think maybe what you can do in the theatre that you can't do in the novel is you can create a moment where people do have empathy for the copper and they do have empathy for the guys selling tickets on Swindon Station and they have empathy for the woman at Wilsdon Green Tube Station who's selling an A to Z. <laughs> and she's only in it for one scene. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what the theatre's for. Yeah. Well, you're absolutely right. It doesn't come across as you're judging these people harshly. In fact, what happens, of course, is that we relate to and recognize ourselves in those people. You're absolutely right. We wouldn't behave any differently. And so it's asking us to look at ourselves in some way. Yeah. It seems obvious that the question is about how kind or otherwise we are. That philosophy that you just described, the great writer Jan Morris, I remember when she turned 90, there was a program done about her. And I think Michael Palin interviewed her. And Michael Palin said, over all your long life traveling and seeing the world and all sorts of people and everything and every religion, what do you think is the key to life? And she just said, kindness. I found that really touching, really powerful uh, and very simple. Yeah. Because if you remove everything else, 
there are a lot of other things that cause trouble when you try and build it into something more. But if it's just that, that's enough. I tell you, I think I never thought I'd live in a time where being kind was a politically radical position to take. <laughs> where, you know, suddenly where where to be kind wasn't just being normal, but to be kind was actually politically radical. But I think if Curious Incident resonates after Trump and after the move to the right in European democracies, and if it resonates even after some of the difficulties of the pandemic, it's because it's insistent on its celebration of kindness, I think. I read somewhere that Mark had said that in the original blurb of the novel, on the back, it described Christopher as having Asperger's syndrome. And Mark said that he regretted that Christopher was labeled with this term, because I believe that nowhere in the book or the play it is he described in specific terms. And as we've said already, all we know is what we see of how he behaves and some of those characteristics. And some of those characteristics, if you look up the National Autistic Society, describe some behaviors that are like Christopher's. But the point about it is that he's not a representative of a category of people. He's unique, isn't he? And I think Mark said that he didn't do lots of research on autism and that basically Christopher comes from his imagination. So what I wanted to know was, what did you do? How did you approach Christopher as a character in these terms? And how has that changed possibly even in the 10 years, say, since the play was first done? Yeah, there's two things to talk about there. One would be to acknowledge that I did no research at all. That for me, my perception of what my job was in making the adaptation was to work from the novel. And my commitment wasn't to a representation of neurodiversity or a representation of any element of the many elements of Christopher's identity. My responsibility was to Christopher Boone, the character from the Mark Haddon novel, that the work of adaptation was a work of faith in storytelling. And there's, there's a kind of segue between my rant on kindness and my observations about how theatre has dealt with neurodiversity in, in recent years is because, to be honest, I think we got a lot of stuff wrong. I think in the early years of this production, we could have worked harder to cast more broadly and to cast from a more neurodiverse community of actors. We made the original production in 2012, and in the 10 years since, there's been a great increase in awareness of, of the potential and the and the viability of actors from a neurodiverse background. And I'm, I'm really thrilled that David and Connor, who were playing Christopher on the current tour, would identify as being on the autistic or Asperger spectrum. They'd identify as being neurodiverse. I think it's worth distinguishing between the work of the writer and the work of the production. And in terms of the writers, me and Mark, we were committed to storytelling. But I think in terms of the production, we always engage with the autistic community. We engaged with the National Autistic Society. You know, the actors went out and there was relationship with schools and relationship with parents, relationship with autistic advisors throughout. And they were inspiring brilliant, brilliant people who I was really glad to have worked with. And I think, you know, we're, we're operating at a time when the nature of social media means that it's very difficult to get things wrong because there's a permanence in wrongness that is latched onto and judged rather unforgivingly. We're living in a time where hypocrisy can be seen as being the biggest sin, but I don't think that is the biggest sin. I think the biggest sin is cruelty. And I think if we've made mistakes in previous productions of Curious Incident, we did it because we were wrong, not because we were cruel. And we had to learn. And I think in this, this iteration of this cast, I think it's demonstrative of a kind of learning. Yes. It's wonderful because when my daughter and I came out of the show last week, we had a conversation about the perception of of autism and, and neurodiversity and this character and the potential pitfalls for writers and, as you say, for performers, for casting. And I noticed in the program afterwards the note, the National Theatre note, and what you've just described about how you were casting actors with lived experience and collaborating with consultants, etc., I think the thing is, the bottom line is, as you say, as the writer, it goes back to Mark saying that he was writing an individual. Yeah, I think it's really key. He wasn't writing a textbook definition of a category. He said, you know, the big question is, Christopher, real? And, and we're all individuals. So why are we categorized or labeled? I think it's a really important question. It's a really wise question. It's something he's always insistent on. And, you know, it's complex, isn't it? Because ordinarily, when we engage with a story, 
they're not necessarily issues that will trouble us or kind of irritate us. If I watched Macbeth, we talked earlier before we started recording about Yale Farber's production of Macbeth. If I watch Macbeth, I don't think, well, that's not how kings would behave. You know, we just think that's just Macbeth. He was just like this particular character and this network of different like engines driving him to behave in this particular way. I think the one time where we do feel that is when we're watching a story that comes close to portraying us. So if I watch a film about a playwright or a play about a playwright, that would be the moment where I go, I actually, do you know what? Being a playwright isn't really like that. Uh, you know, I spend most of my time just kind of looking at the Man United websites and just walking the dog or whatever. <laughs> if both of us watch a play or a film about podcast presenters, then our heckles would rise. Like, Come on, that's not what it's like to really do a <laughs> yeah. podcast. Which is fine. If you're a podcast presenter or a playwright, you're not ordinarily people who have been structurally marginalised away from the, the centre of, of cultural life. But if you're defined by neurodiversity, then kind of you have been. You have been marginalised from the centre of that cultural life for a long time. So then the sense of, come on, that's not what it's like, suddenly has a political urgency that I've got a great deal of sympathy with. But at the same time as having sympathy to that, I absolutely celebrate fundamentally and will go to my deathbed celebrating the right of a storyteller to draw from their imagination. And if storytellers become frightened about drawing from their imagination, as well as from their experience and the experiences they see around them, the world they see around them, then our stories will become atrophied. And I think that would be a grave shame. So interestingly, the the bottom line is, though, when it works is it's about us too, right? It's like, I think Marcus said somewhere else that we are Christopher. Yes. It's not that Christopher's different. Somewhere... We have to recognize that we are also like this. Yes. And I know that so many times in the play, Simon, where the reason we're reacting to it is that we would feel the same things, wouldn't we? Yeah. The whole scene where he goes to London for the first time and he's terrified by the crowds and the noise and he goes into the underground and, you know, that's that's not easy. Yeah. And we all have these moments of terror and fear and anxiety and all that stuff. So surely it's about that. Yeah. Yeah. And quite often in Paddington Station. Yeah, absolutely. But the beauty of this is that we're tested. We're sort of challenged to to see what we have in common rather than the difference we have with Christopher. But also his different view of the world, like what you said earlier when you describe him. One of the, the one of the real beauties of the play in the character of Christopher is that he has a different way of looking at the world that stops us and makes us look differently. Yeah, he's got this powers of concentration and focus that he notices different things. Yeah, and I mean that's a challenge to us too that we don't just have our own blinkers on and we go along the same lines and we don't notice the things that we're passing like he does on the train. He notices different things. It reminded me of that a friend of mine published a book I think actually about things that you see when you wander around the streets of London, Simon, and you look up. Yeah. And you look up at what's on the tops of buildings yeah. or the facades of buildings higher up. Yeah. You never do that. You're never walking along like that, are you? Looking up at the sky. But when you do, it's incredible what's up there. It's why I always I always celebrate people who live in cities like London or New York or Paris or whatever will always have quite a dismissive and understandably dismissive attitude to tourists. But I think it's really important for writers on occasion to think like a tourist. You know, to see your own world as though you've never seen it before. And I think if you have the capacity to see that world in a way you've never seen it before, that's when you get the capacity to see a beauty that has always been there, but you've just not noticed. And I think that's the job of the artist, man. That's the artist's job yeah. is to celebrate to celebrate the truth and the beauty of the world that is there. It's not that we're inventing this stuff. You know, we're using invention as a metaphorical means of communicating it. But our job is to see it. It's like painting strikes me as another analogy I thought of was that at some point in my life, I started trying to do some painting and I did some watercolor classes and various things like that. And you know what was amazing about that, Simon, was not that I was any good, was that it changed how I looked at the world. Yeah. So I could walk outside and I'd be any landscape. I'd be looking at the color. Yeah. I'd be thinking about how those colors are. And of course, that's what the painters are doing. They're changing the way you see by the way they paint it. Yeah. There's a line, isn't there, in the um, when, he, when Christopher says about what he sees, I see everything. Most other people are lazy. They do what is called glancing. 
which is the same word for bumping off something and carrying on in almost the same direction. It's a beautiful <laughs> phrase. I don't know whether that's yours or Mark's. That's Helen. That's definitely Mark. You know, seeing Christopher, maybe it'll, we can change our direction or view. That seems to me what it's partly about, opening our eyes, a different way of looking. I wanted to ask you about the ending of the play, too, because the story doesn't pull any plunches along the way in some respects. Their life is challenging in practical terms, as we said earlier, and as parents in particular. Yeah. And towards the end, Ed and Judy, as you said, are separated. Christopher and his mom are living in a single room in a house with a shared bathroom, which freaks him out. And when she's out at work, he goes to his dad's house for a couple hours after school. So it, it's not easy. No. This is not an easy life. And there's and it's not pretending it is, I think, is one of the great things of the book and the play. But it, there gets a point where we are a bit buoyed towards the end by the puppy you mentioned earlier. And by the A star, the puppy and the A star. He's A star, yeah. He gets the A star. He has this reconciliation of sorts, as you say, the foothills of a reconciliation with his father. And his mother and father look like they're cooperating enough to maybe they can help him get along. Yeah. He announces towards the end that he's going to carry on, having got his A star, and he's going to get an A star in further math yes. and physics. And then he's going to go to university in another town and get a first class degree. And he's going to live in a flat with a garden where his dog can be. And then he will become a scientist. And then he turns to Siobhan, the teacher who's been this great support, but also sort of an objective view, our view. And he asks her, does that mean I can do anything? And he repeats the question twice more. Does that mean I can do anything? Can Christopher do anything, Simon? <laughs> uh, I don't think any living human ever has ever been able to do anything. So definitely the only objective answer to that is no, of course he can't. It's really interesting. It was the first conversation I had with Mark Haddon was about that final paragraph in the novel. Because the novel is written from Christopher's point of view, it's presented in the way that Christopher perceives it as being unproblematic. And it says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a scientist because I solved the mystery of who killed Wellington. I went to London on my own. I found my mother. I was brave. And that means I can do anything. I remember saying to Mark, you don't really think he can do anything, do you? I mean, his life is going to be hard. All of our lives are hard. Everybody's life is hard to varying degrees. And Christopher's, like every other living human, is going to have hard stuff in his life. He won't be able to do anything. And part of accommodating yourself to humanness is acknowledging your failures and frustrations. And he might find that pretty tricky. And Mark was like, that's why you're the best writer for this job. Because he was always astonished by people who read the book as being a celebration of Christopher's power to do anything, which was never his intention. His intention was to have that as a question, which is why I phrased it dramaturgically as an unanswered question at the end of the play. That's why it's an unanswered question. And you see Siobhan struggle to answer it. What's really interesting, anecdotally, is um, quite often, especially in... I don't want to be kind of culturally determinist here, but especially in the US and especially on Broadway, when that question is asked as an unanswered question, members of the audience will shout out, yes! <laughs> and you just think, no, no! The one time, the one time, the second time we did this, we were the first production in the UK to do relaxed performances. Performances for people from a neurodiverse background and people who might have found theatre quite a complicated place to be in. And Curious Incident was really the vanguard of doing those relaxed performances. The second time we did a relaxed performance, we had 50 kids from an autistic specialist school in northwest London that we'd worked with. There were 50 of their kids in the audience. It was the only audience ever that when, <laughs> when Christopher, when Christopher says, Does that mean I can do anything? they shouted out, No! <laughs> <laughs> They're the only ones who've got it right. <laughs> They're the only ones who've been following us. So I know you were the the play. The play builds up to a you know this moment where it wants to be a triumph. You're feeling good at this point. As I said, we've been buoyed, yeah. but it's beautifully poised. As you say, I love the ambiguity of this moment. You don't answer the question. You leave the answer hanging in the air, and. Siobhan, beautifully played, I thought, the other night, actually looks like, I don't know how to tell him the truth of this. Yeah. How do I answer this? Because I don't want to discourage him, but there's just that flicker of doubt in her face as well. Yeah. And I was thought you were going to say when the Americans shout yes, that the British shout no. <laughs> yeah. 
It's not as simple as that, clearly. <laughs> it's not quite as simple as that. Some of us fall for it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we want to, right? You do, because what you've done is, I mean, it's clearly a sentimental dream, I suppose, to, to, to imagine the triumph he's describing. But we also have seen the power of his determination yeah. and his intelligence and courage yeah. on display, certainly. And he's achieved a fair amount already. And I think one of the other important things of this, Simon, for me was that the way you've poised it, and it's beautifully poised in the theater and live with all of us there, is that the question is partly directed at us. So we understand that the chances of his success also depend in some way on us, on how we respond to him and others like him mm. and the world that we create that he inhabits, yeah. right? Because if we stack it against him, he's fucked. If we don't, he's got a chance, at least some chance. And I say him or others like him, not, there's no one like him. More accurately, others not like him, just not like us. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I think if you frame it as a question that's unanswered, it's more placed in the audience's imagination. And for me, that's where drama sits most excitingly, not necessarily on the stage or not necessarily on the page, but in the space between the audience and the stage. Theatre is a space of interpretation. You know, we go to the theatre to recognise ourselves and we go to the theatre to think, to ask the question, what would I do in that situation? And how is that, that murderous king of Scotland from the 14th century a little bit like me? Or how is that teenage Russian girl in Moscow at the turn of the 20th century, how am I a little bit like her? Theatre, as I said, is a place that we go to learn learn of ourselves and learn what it's like to be human and what our own humanness is. And if that question at the end is, can Christopher do anything? We just got to sit in that as a question for a while. The first time I met uh, the playwright Edward Bond was the first thing he said to me, never answer the question. The question is all we have. <laughs> okay, that's great. I mean, because I absolutely literally... What you've just said, it just made me go back to that moment. I could feel it hanging in the air, literally feel. Yeah. Siobhan's up there on the stage, Christopher's on the stage, and we are in the audience, and it's there in between us. It is, as you've just described, it's brilliant. And the question, yes, you didn't answer, but you posed some wonderful ones. Okay, we're running out of time now. Great way to finish, so thank you, Simon. It's a real pleasure. I've got one more thing before I let you go. Yeah. One of the traditions of the podcast is I'd like to ask my guests if they could recommend a play that we could talk about in a future episode. Of course, I'd dearly love to have you back to talk about another one of your own plays. And I realize it is somewhat ridiculous to single out one play, especially for someone like yourself. But is there a personal favorite that at this moment you'd be happy to throw into the ring? Oh, man. The, the terrible thing is, Douglas, is I'm a massive fan of plays. Like, and, and as soon as I'll commit to one, I'll be like, oh, and I could have said that. Are you, are you interested in plays which have an upcoming London life? Does that really help you? No, no, not at all, because the, the podcast is evergreen. It's about the play itself, so it's not about its particular production. All right, great. My favourite playwright from the last 50 years died just a couple of weeks ago is a writer called Robert Holman, H-O-L-M-A-N. And if you, if, you, if you find the right person to talk to for an hour about his play Rafts and Dreams. I think it's a masterpiece. I think it's a play that predicts our time and will survive our time. And somebody in the next five years will do a revival of Rafts and Dreams by Robert Holman that will break people's hearts. And, and maybe the starting point of that revival will be this podcast, Douglas. <laughs> somebody, Let's do it. Let's do it. Somebody listening to you talk to any of the people who've ever been involved in that production about that play, I think you'll have a great time. You'll have a great conversation. Okay, I'm going to make it happen. I know that Nick Hearn, his publisher, is a huge fan of Robert's, and I'm sure there are others, and we can... We'll set something up. And if I can't find the right person, I'm going to come back and ask you to help me find the right person or do it yourself even. I could talk for an hour about Ruffs and Dreams, very happily talk for an hour about Ruffs and Dreams. Oh, well, you may have just committed yourself there. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Douglas. Simon, it's been a complete joy. I'm going to just bring the curtain down. As the curtain falls on Christopher and the mystery of the dead dog and his A-level math equation, what is triumphant about this play is that despite how different Christopher appears to be, in the end, we recognize that we all feel like he does at times in our day-to-day -day lives. The result is an understanding of what we have in common with each other, rather than a distrust of why we are different, which is perhaps the definition of empathy. 
And to quote Simon and the playwright James Graham, who said in our last episode, theater is an empathy factory. Christopher proves this right. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Thanks for listening. To listen to other episodes, to find out news about future episodes, or to leave comments about what you've heard, please visit us at www.theplaypodcast.com. You can also follow us on Facebook or on Twitter at The Play Pod. You're also welcome to email plays at theplaypodcast.com to suggest plays that we could talk about in future episodes. You can also register your suggestion on the website. Thanks again, and see you next time.